In 1914, the world was about to be embroiled in two bitter world wars. The nation of England actually almost lost a whole generation. Hitler marched across Europe, taking everything in his path that he could. But in the middle of all this destruction and despair, two brothers emerged. Two brothers that decided to become the one in their generation. These two Welsh miners decided to step out in faith and show the world who God really was. And they brought revival in a big way. In fact, let me read you these newspaper headlines. Here from the London Express, Welsh miners turn miracle ministers. And then, Welsh minister births new church denomination. Listen, these guys were the real deal. They were about to take us on a journey of faith and a journey of revival. It's amazing because these guys were so anointed. You have Stephen. He just, he was a star, if you want to call it a preacher that. He was dynamite. He had a firebrand, firecracker jumper. He, he was a Welsh miner. And so, of course, he wasn't afraid of a fight. His preaching just swept over you like you would experience a tsunami. And he saw supernatural miracles. George, he's as shy and introverted as, as Stephen is, is an extrovert. And George is, the newspapers called him mesmerizing. You waited. What was going to be the next thing he had to say? In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Welcome back to Revival Radio TV. I'm your host, Gene Bailey. So glad you're with us today. Today, I'm joined again by Doug Bonner. Nice Doug, thank you for joining again. We've got a great topic. We're going to talk about two brothers, the Jeffries brothers. One of my favorite stories of revival because it just kept, kept going. It did. And it's had far-reaching implications. Tell me, let's start right at the beginning. Tell me about the Jeffries brothers. Well, I want to take you back to 1900, height of the British Empire. And Queen Victoria is the Queen of England, a young boy who had a dream. His name was George. He's 10, 11 years old. He feels called to preach, but he starts to get paralysis on, on the left side of his face. Mm. It's all numb. And, uh, and then it, it kind of moves to his tongue. He can't speak. He's got a speech impediment. And it's like, man, the dream is lost. But he had a wonderful experience. Uh, him and his brother were busy about the ministry. Now, they weren't preaching yet, but they were helping. And prayer meetings were the order of the day. So they're in a, a, a prayer meeting Sunday morning. They're getting ready for the, the church uh, service and something happens. And I'll just quote here from George. He said um, that when my mouth began to be afflicted, one thing that distressed me greatly was the possibility of not realizing the one call and ambition in my life, the ministry. But God intervened and he said this in this prayer meeting here. It seemed as if my head were connected to the most powerful electric uh, battery. My whole body from the head to the foot was quickened by the spirit of God and I was healed. Wow. Uh, just just transformed. So he just had an encounter with the Holy Ghost there. Now, I mean, he, he wasn't even asking for it. <laughs> it had to be the overflow. OK, so let's back up. So George gets sick with this paralysis and speech impediment. And Stephen, st they're still working in the mines at this time? Stephen was. George was, he was not healthy enough to, so they got him a job elsewhere. But you know what? They saw the anointing on these guys. I mean, they obviously had something. But that miracle was a signature for both of their lives. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are called, and it's like, how do you do this? You know, because uh -huh. we see, like, Brother Copeland in, in front of large audiences. Well, they started where they were. Mm. So they both had you know, full-time jobs. So they started doing uh, anything in the ministry um, on their own time. There's a great uh, story about Stephen. He's the older guy. He was fascinated by outdoor preaching. 
So he loved it. So here's a good story. So he would, he would come home from the mines. He's covered in coal. He would get all cleaned up and go straight out. Right. And so he would attract a crowd. He, he had a strong voice. You know, I mean, uh, both him and his brother could sing beautifully. And all of a sudden, there's a crowd around them. And, and an older lady sees George, who's not very tall, <laughs> with all these people. So she brings out a chair. And she says, son, get on the chair. So he's... He's now almost on a pulpit. He's preaching to these people. But Stephen, he was not a short-winded preacher. And so he was preaching and it was getting dark. So she goes back into the house. She gets an oil lamp and she holds that for him so he can preach. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he was doing and stuff. And all of this while they're still working in the coma. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I mean, think that's a, that's a great thing to stop here and point out. Because so many believers that I know, and I'm, I must tell you, even in my own life, there are times where you go, God, I'm waiting for an open door. Give me this open door. And yeah. the reality is, you know, as Todd White says, you know, put a piece of lead in your pocket and feel lead whenever you need. Just go do it. Just go do it. And that's what we talk about. Be in the one. Just be the one where you're at. But he was working in the coal mine, I mean, like for 25 years, if I yes. remember the right. Yes. So, I mean, it, this was no conversion and miracle and healing over a weekend and launch into a ministry with thousands saved. So this is, this is an amazing story of tenacity. Yep. There's a miracle, but then there's great results. So keep, keep going. What happens next? Stephen began to, to branch out on his own and have meetings. And, and hers were a gentleman that we know of called Alexander uh, Body. He was a, a Church of England, an Episcopalian, minister who'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit in Sunderland, he heard about these two Welsh brothers. He came down to, uh, to meet them. And here's where the prayer of George was answered because Alexander saw the calling on this young man. He was very eloquent and um, he was comfortable around a king or a cook. And so he invited the young George to his new Bible school. Remember, George, he had um, to join the workforce at 12 years old. Right. Couldn't get an education. So we have the first Pentecostal. So that was a big deal. Big. To be invited and not have an yeah. education. Yeah. yeah, as well. So here's George. Uh, he gets up. And, and so there's two things he, he learns. It's called the Pentecostal Missionary Union. And it started by Alexander uh, 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 Body, but someone else that you know of Cecil uh, Polehill. He was one of mm -hmm. the Cambridge Seven. So tell me about the Cambridge Seven. Well, these were uh, seven Cambridge uh, students who felt the call of God to go to, across the tracks, across the world to China, but they were different from the kind of the missionary of the day. They would learn the culture and the dress and the language. And of course, Hudson uh, uh, Taylor was the leader of that group. But a gentleman called Cecil Polehill, he went along. Mm -hmm. He had to come back because he was unwell, but decides to come back through Los Angeles in 1906. When there's a little, a little revival going on over there in Los Angeles. In Azusa Street. Yeah, yeah. I just learned this here uh, 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 recently. He was a pretty wealthy guy. He paid the mortgage off on that building. Uh, oh, wow. Man, I mean, just what a seed to sow. He comes back to the UK, he meets them. And that's why we need to be prosperous. You know, in this ministry talks about prosperity. Yes. That's why, because we can further the gospel and take it where it hasn't been gone. And you, can you imagine when he walked in and paid off that building, what that must have been like for uh, Seymour and everyone there? Like, wow, now I don't have to think about this anymore. Just like that. That's so interesting because... This plays a big part in the ministry of George and, and mm. Stephen, you know, you know, through the years. And it's what uh, George had learned at the Bible school. It was to have a, a ministry of faith and trust yeah. in God. And because over the years, uh, you know, George and Stephen became great evangelists. They would hire the most expensive or the largest buildings to have a meeting, very expensive. But they didn't, you know, shy back from that. So, and you know, that's a, that's a good point there, Doug. They didn't shy back from the, and at that day and era, that was massive. Yeah. That was a massive undertaking. And I'm sure there was a resistance to all that they were doing by going out and renting something, go big. They went big for God and they, it's like, go big or go home. And that's exactly what they did. 
And that was faith in action. It was. And, and it's what we define as prosperity is meeting the needs of the people mm -hmm. and not saying, well, I can't do that. I don't have the money. Right. It's like um, uh, Lester Sumrall said, I've never had the money when I started a big project. Right. And so, but that's faith. And so uh, the two things that, that George, he was only there a short time because Stephen was saying, come and help me. I've only got three sermons. <laughs> and so, so, so the more studious George had to come and help him out. But two things he learned in that school. Um, he was a stickler for the word of God. Right. He stuck with wow. the scriptures. So even with all the Pentecostal, the charismatic manifestations, we're still Bible people. Mm. All right, so there was a supernatural event that happened before World War I. What was that? Yeah, yeah. So it, it is July, and uh, Stephen has been asked to try it really for a church. And so he's preaching, mm -hmm. and he said on this evening, he felt a special anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so he sensed that, but he also senses that the congregation aren't, aren't you know, staring at him. Their attention is somewhere else. And so it's only after that he, he finishes that this happens. It's in a place called Clanifly. That's my best Welsh I can do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow, that was impressive. Uh, there we go. And so a picture is forming on the wall. I think we have this, this is the Confidence uh, magazine, and there's a picture of George, and X marks the spot here, mm. where he was preaching, no, uh, Stephen, sorry, he was preaching, and his wife was seeing this image appear behind him. It began as a lamb, and then it turned into the picture of a man, and it's obviously then the face of, of, of Jesus, but right. his head is lowered, and there are tears coming down. So he there's an, they're seeing Jesus at the... Behind him. Absolutely. And George and Stephen Robert, he was preaching on Philippians 3.10 that we would know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. Wow. And so um, he was moved by this so, so much. He said, uh, when I came down from um, among the congregation and I, uh, I saw the living face of Jesus, he said, with Jewish features, hair like wool, and parted in the, the, uh, the middle. Now, now, there was a man who said, oh, it's just the lights, it, but a painter there who painted houses, he took his handkerchief and he held it over. He tried to erase it, and then it just wouldn't go. He handed it over, and he realized it was glowing out of the wall. Mm. And so um, I like to think I drove down from Oklahoma here last night and I used signs to get here right. and they got me to the right destination. And any sign that points you to Jesus or the word of God is a good sign. And this was because it really is stirred up uh, Stephen who said, I felt... He said, um, after I prayed about you know, the meaning of this, it seemed to be a sign of a terrible suffering about to come, but I did not know what it was. Well, Gene, two weeks later, we've got World War I. Yeah. In that time, I'm thinking about, they're getting all these people saved by the hundreds. You know, to, people are getting saved everywhere they go. What do they, what do, they do with all these people? Do they just kind of leave them there and hope they find their way to a church? What do they do? Yeah, because... That happened, I mean, over revival history, that, that, that has happened so much. But, but George, he's up in Northern Ireland, and he's going to have a big crusade, and he ends up really starting a church. And he felt it was an oasis. And there's a word in the Old Testament that it kind of means that, and it's Elim. So we have the foundations of the Elim Pentecostal mm. Church. Right. So, so they, he started churches everywhere he went. And in his lifetime, um, I mean, over 200 churches. So they would actually go get people saved and then build the church. Here's a big problem. They didn't have enough pastors. Mm. And here's the great well, story. I would think so. They wouldn't have enough that could, that could believe the way they were believing. Yeah, and yeah. teach the way they were teaching. So they would have, um, you know, 3,000 uh, 3, people getting saved. I mean, just the numbers all over. And then 1,000 people 
would come to their new church. Mm. But here's a good story. There's a lady here we have. Her name is... And what's this book you've got? This is a book. It's called In Defense of His Word. Word. It is full of healing miracles. I mean, from front to back, I mean, even before and after photographs here. And there's a, a, uh, a lady here who had... Now, I think it's called tuberculosis tuberculosis of the knee. She couldn't walk. She was in bandages. Her skin gave her problems for years and she was supernaturally healed. Here's a picture, Jean, of her standing wow, yeah. after she was healed. And she became one of the pastors. Hmm. So basically homegrown. So, but that was pretty unusual back then in, in England to have a women a woman pastor. Oh, you know what? I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, that was pretty radical thinking. Then. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was a sign of, of the whole Pentecostal uh, movement. Have you have you noticed, Doug, a little departure here? In all of these revivals, even the ones that happen in the United States, that always they seem to always push the boundaries of social economics, of uh, maybe whether it was racism in America yeah, yeah. or women preachers. There's there's always it's always overcoming some block that's there. I, you know, I think of A. A. Allen and uh, even Oral Roberts how. They had to fight racism so much and allow blacks and whites to come to their meeting and it was okay. And I mean, to their own detriment, they, they really got challenged yeah. on all of these things. So this is, that's another sign. It's not, not a requirement, but it's another sign of a revival, a true revival that overcomes all of those things. Yes. And even the Welsh revival with the miners and what was going on, it was a, you know, we talk about how rough the miners were, but the whole city in that time in Wales, all of that was not, it was not a friendly to the gospel type time. Right. I mean, people, there was church, but there wasn't, it wasn't a friendly atmosphere to, so this was a huge thing that happened. I just find that interesting that God always, even Azusa with Seymour, how, I mean, here's a black man and uh, how dare he have something, <laughs> how dare he know something that we don't know. And that was amazing. It just amazes me that it was an African, a, a, a American that headed up the whole yeah. thing. But, uh, and what we forget, because I grew up in this, is that church in England was the church of England. Right. And so very formal. The service was, you know, like, you know, uh, 1644 version of I say this, amen, 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 all this kind of stuff. That was church. Right. So what these guys were doing was not church. <laughs> But, but people saw the miracles and realized, oh, no, God is in this. Okay, Linda, what's next? Well, Stephen is busy preaching and bringing in hundreds of new converts, creating what would be a full church. So George is coming along and he's creating that. But there were so many that were being birthed, 25 a year, that George couldn't do it alone. 25 churches a year. Wow. A year, uh-huh. And E.J. Phillips came on board and was his right-hand man. So he was busy putting this guy to work, finding land, buildings, and he was busy also setting up for the campaigns. It's, the team was worked off their feet. And so in the middle of this, you have Stephen who falls in love with the this brand new thing called the Assembly of God. And you have his son, he's, he's given birth to a son, Eddie, and Eddie's watching this whole process going on. He takes it over from, from George. And so he, he's gonna want to uh, figure out a, a secondary plan. And so now th they go two separate ways and today, as it kept going on, it was good because Stephen and Eddie put together 60 churches. George put together uh, over uh, 270. And today, his churches, currently George's churches, there's 5,000 of them still in existence. Wow. So he's quite, these guys were quite the church planners. All right. So doctors and healings. Well, the doctors said after World War One, you know, I mean, there's, Doug will tell you two and a half million people are on, on assistance. The doctors would get a person in, treat them as fast as they could. Here's a brace, move on to the next desperate case. It was, it was horrible. I mean, they just didn't have antibiotics or anything. In fact, um, George had a, uh, a woman come to one of his services. And what was amazing is they would advertise, healing will happen. And it did. And so he had this one lady come to the service and she was prayed for. And she says, okay, you prayed for me. I believe I'm healed. She said, but I still have metal inside me that the doctors put in me. What do I do about that? And George sent her home. He said, don't worry about it. He says, let God take care of it. The next morning she wakes up in bed, 
and next to her is all the metal that had been inside her. Wow. Yeah, wow, so cool. Wow, isn't that cool? And yeah. I like the fact, you know, if I can pause right here, in this story, did you catch what she, Linda just said? He was a man of faith, and the faith was healings will happen. Yes. Didn't say, hey, come see what God might do. He said healings will happen. And thousands were. But that's not all about the Jeffrey brothers, is it? No. It was said of them that in their day, Stephen and George uh, Jeffries saw more miracles than anyone right. since the time of Jesus. Just an outpouring. Yeah, and there were thousands saved, thousands saved in their ministry. It's these numbers of hundreds and hundreds, and all the names of, of the places I knew as a boy, Bournemouth and Swansea, right. you know, Birmingham, or as we say, Birmingham, and, yeah, sure. and, and just, just numbers and numbers after each other. History has recorded the fact that God has never left the world without a witness to this glorious message throughout the present dispensation. In our day, there are multitudes who are testifying to the blessings they have received through this ministry. The greatest revival that the world has ever witnessed is taking place through the Foursquare Gospel message. Hundreds of thousands of lives and homes have been transformed. It is the worldwide outpouring of the Holy Spirit with supernatural signs that tens of thousands of born-again people are experiencing in every country under the canopy of heaven. In fulfillment of prophecy given in both the Old and New Testaments, God is pouring out His Spirit. Believers are everywhere receiving the Holy Spirit as the disciples did on the day of Pentecost. Miracles of healing, just as marvelous as those recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, are taking place in every land. For the miraculous gifts are in evidence today, just as they were in the first days of Christianity. His recordings, people said that his preaching was so dynamic, the recordings didn't do it justice. That's true. In Plymouth, he preaches 1,500 saved, Liverpool, 800. They were turning people away, hundreds. Burma, there was 1,500 saved, Leeds, 2,290. Cardiff on the sea, stormy weather, couldn't keep people away, 5,000 saved. Birmingham had over 10,000 saved. Wow. 1,000 people started its first church. You're baptizing 1,100 people in water. Have you ever, mm. I, I just can't imagine. Three churches were birthed from here. At one point he asked at a meeting how many had been healed. They couldn't count how many. So he said, okay, and I'm paraphrasing, how many backs healed, how many eyes healed, and, and they went that way and they still couldn't figure out how many. There was just so many sheer numbers of healings. But George's problem to what do I do with all of these churches I'm birthing is he builds a Bible college. And the focus of the Bible college was to say, what do I need to know about the Bible? And what does my church need to know in order to succeed? And today, all but two of his churches are still in existence. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, that is so interesting. We have a reporter here called Landau. Here's his headline, you know, um, 500 wait to be prayed for, a few fall down on the floor, dead as, as, as faint. But this guy was trying as best as he could to be skeptical, but couldn't be. I couldn't be, because the results were too in his face. Well, I mean, he said, the, look, these were working class people and you could not doubt their honesty of their testimony. But it wasn't one, there were hundreds. Here's the book, Just a Miracle, with um, photographs. And uh, here's another interesting thing, because, you know, the mainline church, I grew up in the Church of England, and I mean, they would have seen these guys and thought, what is going on? But a whole lot of their members who were sick, because there was no medicine like we have today, but even today people, you know, I mean, get sick, but they would come back and testify of their healings. So that brought these guys into the meetings themselves. And, and, um, and George was very good on this. He kept numbers, look at this. 61 testified to relief from limb disorders, 21 healed of cancer and tumors. And so just the numbers go on and on. You know, well, you know Doug, he's not the only person that had contact with the Jeffries brothers. In fact, I wanna show you something right now about how Reinhard Bonnke, Christ for All Nations, his contact with the Jeffries brothers, watch. So I walked through the front garden 
and I pressed the bell and the lady opened. I said, ma'am, my name is Reinhard Ponky. May I ask a question? Does the George Jeffrey live in this house who was that firebrand evangelist and brought the gospel of signs and wonders to the British Isles? She said to me, yes. <laughs> oh, I said, may I please see him? She said, no. <laughs> and please excuse me for saying it, but that lady filled the door frame. I couldn't pass. <laughs> But while she said no, suddenly I heard a voice, a deep voice from the inside. Let him come in. <laughs> I don't know how I passed that barrier. <laughs> But in I was, and I saw him come down the stairs, perfectly dressed, as if he had been waiting for someone. He came down, I shook his hand, I, I started to talk. I said, my name is Reinhard Bonnke. I've read your books, and Jesus has called me to be an evangelist in Africa. I have prepared for it. I know that God used you to bring the... I, look, 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 look. I was not talking all the time. <laughs> He didn't say a word. That old man didn't say a word. He just put his hand on my shoulder, and then he fell on his knees, on the carpet and pulled me down with him and laid his hands on me and blessed 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 me and the glory of the Lord appeared. Seeing Reinhard Bonnke in the million saved in his ministry is awesome. Reinhard was George Jeffrey's final impartation. Here, Stephen was a rough Welsh miner, and George was a frail man with a speech impediment. Yet, look what God was able to do with him. You know, I think one thing that really impressed me in these two brothers is they really did go after their calling. They just went out and did it. They made a decision. And the fruit of that, people were saved and they were healed. When you don't have any like-minded Christians or churches to send thousands to, build your own church. God had to teach these brothers just how to do that, how to birth a church. They created mega churches for their time. When they didn't have enough pastors, George Jeffries did this. He started a Bible school. He had two goals in his school, teach Bible basics and teach people how to become a pastor and how to staff a church. All of George's churches, except two, are active and thriving to this day. I don't think you're ever done with the story of this family or who their lives have impacted over the years. What we've seen with Reinhard Bonnke, it's amazing. And now with Daniel Kalinda, it continues to be amazing. Each person stepped up to be the one. Expand in your life what it means to be the one. Let God use you like never before. Put him to the test. We'll see you next time right here on Revival Radio TV.